In 1919, Enos Gordon Gowdy founded the Gowdy Gum Company in Boston, Massachusetts. He built his business through the Roaring Twenties and became a major manufacturer known as the Gum King of America. When the stock market crashed in 1929 and the Depression began, Gowdy kept at it. He sold the business in 1932, and the Gowdy Gum Company, under new management, made the bold decision to produce a set of baseball cards to encourage the sale of their gum. In the pits of the Depression, when most people didn't have a penny to spare, the penny packs of 1933 Gowdy baseball cards became a sensation. Of all the card sets in baseball card land, most card sharks agree that there are three sets that rule them all. The 1952 Tops, the 1909 T206, and the 1933 Gowdy. The 33 Gowdy set was the first set to come with bubblegum wrapped in wax paper, a revolution as it turns out. All of the early cards came in boxes with tobacco products or candy, like the American Caramel cards or the Cracker Jack cards, which came in a box pre-doused in butter and peanut oil. The 1933 Gowdies didn't come in a box. They were wrapped up with a piece of gum, and so were a thicker cardstock than their tobacco predecessors, lending a certain resilience to them that has left us with a handsome selection remaining nearly a hundred years later. The full set was 239 cards, with card 106 purposefully missing to keep people buying gum packs in search of the card. Card 106, which featured Napoleon Lajoie, wouldn't become available until 1934, and only then by mail order. Lajoie had been retired nearly 20 years by then. Of the 240 cards in the set, inclusive of the Napoleon Lajoie card, the set was dominated by the New York Giants and the Washington Senators, but a good many teams got cards, including some oddball minor league players from the Oakland Oaks, Atlanta Crackers, and Minneapolis Millers, among others. The Phillies have 10 cards represented in the 33 Gowdy collection, and after a winding journey of collecting Nirvana, I have completed the team set. It was never my intent to get into the pre-war cards, but all the way back in episode 11, I told the story of flipping through a dollar box at a show in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and coming across this card, number 132, Jumbo Jim Elliott. Yeah, it was a little dirty, and the corners are round, but the picture is straight up history. Jumbo Jim Elliott was an anomaly in the 30s. Well over six feet tall and close to 250 pounds, he was far bigger than most players of his era. That imposing size and strength gave him an advantage on the mound, and this hard-throwing lefty was feared throughout the league. This baseball card is 90 years old, from one of the single most iconic sets of all time. One dollar? Get in my collection, Jumbo Jim. You are welcome here. Of course, I bought it. And just like that, I was a Gowdy collector. Flint Ream and Harry McCurdy were next. About a month later, Two cards I picked up online for $10 in an auction that ended at an odd time from a seller who mostly sold vintage knickknacks and who titled the listing as Old Baseball Cards. I have a set of saved searches with oddball terms trying to catch these types of listings, which can have fewer eyeballs on them and therefore fewer dollars in the price. Flint Ream played the bulk of his career with the Cardinals, winning five pennants and three World Series with them. He was traded to the Phillies midway through the 1932 season and stayed for 33-2, giving us this card before he was shipped back to St. Louis. Harry McCurdy was a journeyman catcher who played for the Cardinals, White Sox, Phillies, and Reds. His time in Philadelphia lasted four seasons, 1930-1933. Three cards into the Gowdy team set. Total spent? 11 bucks. I found Cliff Heathcote here at an antique mall. They had a case in the front with some old cards, mostly 49 Bowmans, but a few Gowdies and Playballs in there, too. I tracked someone down to unlock the case and flipped through the small pile 
until old Cliff here popped out. He was priced at $25, so I offered 20 The very nice lady explained that they weren't hers to sell, and she would need to contact the seller. Now, I wasn't going to badger this poor woman over $5 when $25 was already a good price for the card, so I just gave the full $25 asking price. Four cards down, $36 spent. Next up was Dick Bartell, card number 28. Bartell had a reputation of being a hothead, which is old-timey speak for pain in the ass. So he bounced around from team to team until he wore out his welcome. He spent four seasons with the Phillies and was an all-star with them in 1933, the year of this card. I came across this card on eBay doing my weekly Sunday night suite, as Sunday night just seems to be the hobby's agreed-upon time to end card auctions. Having won a separate auction with Greg Morris cards the day before, I was hoping I could scoop up something else and combine the shipping. This card caught my eye because it is autographed. I saw this with 30 minutes to go on the auction with only one bid at 99 cents. So I waited and put in a snipe bid with 5 seconds to go at 10 bucks and won it for 4.75. When it arrived, I did some minor forensics on the auto and by all accounts it is genuine. Bartell is also genuinely wearing a pirate's uniform in the image, but will forgive Gowdy for the error. 5 cards, halfway there. 41 bucks out of pocket. I knew the run of luck would end. It always does. Plus, the big card of the set, Hall of Famer Chuck Klein, was ahead of me, as was Virgil Davis, which just seemed to be rare and expensive when compared to the others in the set. But then, I continued to get lucky. As described in episode 24, I came upon the Chuck Klein at a show. I paid $60 for a pair of Gowdies, including the Klein and a 1934 Gowdy Don Hurst, it's unfair to say that this deal was $30 each, as the Klein is by far the more valuable card. So for the sake of record keeping, let's say this was $40 for the Klein and $20 for the Hurst. Chuck Klein was one of the greatest hitters of his era, and of all time. Klein had three stints with the Phillies, totaling 15 seasons. He was the National League MVP in 1932, and won the batting Triple Crown in 1933, when he was an All-Star too. He led the league four times in home runs, twice in RBIs, and once in stolen bases, among other accomplishments. He was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 1980 by the Veterans Committee. Now this is a big card, and was a huge pickup for the price, even with the crease. Six down, four to go. $81 spent. Fred Brickle was the next step to team set completeness, another eBay pickup from Greg Morris Cards. Ending price, $13. Brickle played for four seasons with the Phillies, an average outfielder, an average bat. Of all the cards in the set, this is the one that best represents what the uniform of the era looked like. The P on the hat of this era was red, and often you see it reproduced in blue. Seven cards down, three to go. Ninety-four bucks gone. Phil Collins here, card 21, came by way of good old-fashioned trading. I've got a friend who bought a collection of cards and this was in there. He's a part-time dealer, but really only sells ultra-modern stuff. He saw it was a Phillies card and sent a text to me asking if I wanted it, which of course I did. How much? What new stuff do you have laying around? Any chrome? As it turns out, I had bought a lot of 2023 Topps Chrome Phillies that came with a bunch of duplicates. That lot was $5 and $5 shipping, totaling 10 bucks. I took the 2023 Topps Chrome team set out of it sold another team set from it for $5, and had these left over, including a bunch of Bryce Harpers. I sent him a pick of the Chrome cards. Deal. But first beer is on you next time. Done. So I traded a pile of 2023 Topps Chrome, including several Bryce Harpers that cost me 5 bucks and a pint of triple IPA at a local brewery, for another 7 $12, and I had the Phil Collins. Eight cards down and I'd reached the $100 mark at $106 spent in acquisitions. I thought the Collins was my last card of 2023, but wouldn't you know that Santa brought me a card. Opening gifts on Christmas morning, there was a curiously baseball card-sized present for me under the tree. I tore off the wrapping paper, and there was Jackie Warner staring back at me. My sweet wife went into my eBay account and peeked at my watch list, which had a couple of Jackie Warners sitting there, and snagged one without my knowledge. 
What a great gift. I hope your wife does similar things for you. Jackie Warner only played for the Phillies in 1933 and only for 107 games, mostly at second base. He only bat 224, though, so he didn't last long. A forgettable ball player, but such a cool card. That's the smile of a man who loves his job. We should all be so lucky. Nine cards down, one to go. Since the Warner was a gift, I won't count it against my budget. That left only Virgil Davis, the catcher. His nickname was Spud. Spud's 1933 Gowdy card was the hardest to find and pricey. I never saw him at a show and only came upon his cards in online auctions. Spud had two stints with the Phillies and was a great ball player. He was a career 308 hitter and in 1933 finished second in the batting championship behind his teammate Chuck Klein. Spud bat 349 that year. And today is the day. A mail day nearly a year in the making. I was watching a few Buy It Nows on eBay and noticed after the new year, several got price cuts. This Virgil Davis card was originally priced at $49.99, then dropped to $39.99, then was knocked down in 2024 to $29.99 with a best offer added. I offered $20, day countered at $24.86, which I accepted. We'll round that up to $25. And here he is. Spud himself. Some of you may be chortling to yourself about the corners, scoffing about low-grade this and raw card that. But this is the essence of collecting. Holding the card, which is 91 years old, smelling the lignin, feeling the cardboard fibers. Welcome, Virgil. You complete the 1933 Gowdy Phillies team set. Collected start to finish over the better part of a year for a total budget of $131, an average of about $13 per card. Dean's Cards, the only source for a complete set like this, sells this team set in similar condition for $1,400. $345 will buy you an 8-card set that doesn't include the Bartell, and mine is autographed, or the Chuck Klein, which is very much the whale of the set. There is great collecting satisfaction in putting together your own sets, your own runs, under budget, and ahead of schedule. What's interesting about this team on a whole is that in 1933, the Phillies were terrible. 60 wins and 92 losses for a 7th place finish in the National League. Despite having the reigning NL MVP in Chuck Klein, who hit for the Triple Crown in 33, and Spud Davis, who was second to Klein in the batting championship, and Dick Bartell, who was an all-star. All the lumber in the world couldn't overcome their lack of any pitching talent. C'est la vie. So there's the story of collecting a 1933 Gaudi team set from start to finish. To do this for the Yankees would require four Babe Ruth cards and two Lou Gehrig cards before mentioning any other card in the set. Just those six cards alone would require a second mortgage. One of the many reasons I'm happy to be a Phillies fan. Thanks for watching. Completing a set is collecting at its core. Tune in next time for more baseball card stories, legends, 